Hi everyone, today I want to talk to you about data loaders in version 13. I want to show you what we have done to make data loaders so much easier for you. All the things I show you today are really version 13 specific. By the way, we are doing workshops at multiple conferences throughout the year. So if you want to spend two days with Martin and me diving deep into GraphQL and exploring technologies like hot chocolate, Relay and how to build modern applications with React on top of GraphQL, join us and we will have some fun. If you like our content, please hit the like and subscribe button below the video. And with that, let's dive in. So I have already prepared here a little project. I'm actually upgrading at the moment our demo content for the workshop that we are doing at NDC London. And this is basically the base of it. We have a data layer here with a couple of entities. The workshop is built around cryptocurrencies. So we have assets, which are our cryptocurrencies. So the coins like Bitcoin and ADA and what have you. We have prices and a lot of other entities here. Then we have here the asset DB context. So we're using entity framework as a base and everything is here set up very basic. So let me show you one thing that we have really changed. So if you go to our setup here, you can see that I'm just using a at DB context here. So in the past, I would recommend you to use the pool DB context combined with the factory approach, but that didn't sit well with a lot of people because uh, then repositories become harder and a lot of their, their APIs would need to change just to fit in with the GraphQL approach. So we have changed that and when we register now here a DB context, it's actually registered with the resolver scope. That means we are scoping each DB context per field. You could have done that with hot chocolate 12, but there was always the problem around the data loaders. So let me show you first how we would do a data loader in version 12. There were actually two approaches here. I could have done an inline data loader so let's go here to the queries type, for instance. And if we introduced a new resolver here that fetches the asset by its symbol, then to write an inline data loader, we could also inject here the resolver context. And then we have here an extension method where we could say batch data loader. And then we could pass in a delegate here and do the things. The problem here is that the data loader you create here is captured and reused in other resolvers. And this really has the problem that things that I capture here, like services, the DB context, are reused over time. And this leads actually to exceptions within the data loader that the context may be used by different threads or that the context already is disposed. So in order to use the inline batch data loader, you really need to take care about capturing a correct context, maybe scoping the service context here and doing some nasty work. So I don't like that approach really much. The second approach would be to actually create a class data loader. So this is our data loader class here. You can see there's a lot more that I just have to write up. And a lot of this is just implementing the class here, the base class, but it's actually not good enough because now we are injecting here the asset context. And again, we are reusing now the request scoped asset context, and that would lead to exceptions when there are at least two data loaders or the data loader is triggered twice. So in order to make that safe, actually, we have to get rid of the asset context here. Then in the case that we used now, we would need to inject a service provider here and we introduce it up here, get rid of the context here. And then we would await here a scope. And then from this scope, we could get the asset context. And then down here, we just fix that up. And now we have a safe data loader and that really does what we want. And this data loader, we could now use up here to load our asset. But that is a ton of code and let me show you something. So this here is the project that we used so far that is essentially done with version 12. And you can see I have a ton of data loaders here. And if I have to write all these data loaders and this is just a demo project here, then it's so much redundant code that I have to use that it's really not a joy to use it. So we rethought data loaders as a whole. So let's rewrite that for version 
13. So first let's get rid of this and also let's get rid of that and maybe we just comment this method out here. So what I thought is it would be cool to co-locate the data loader actually with the GraphQL specific stuff that we have anyway. Like in this instance, we have here an asset node and this asset node has a resolver that extends the actual asset. So wouldn't it be cool if we could just write here a little method? And if we look at that method, it's called get asset by symbol. And we have here one line that actually gets all the data. Then this looks semantically more correct. This is our asset. And this essentially is a factory to load our assets in batches. But how do we get that to a data loader? And that's where we introduced a new attribute here called data loader. And if we put that on top, what happens is actually that a source generator will go ahead and let's have a look here at the source generators and you can see here's hot chocolate. And if we look at that, we can see that the source generator already went ahead and wrote us a nice data loader here with all the stuff that we didn't want to write, which is referring to our method here. But it's still not in the way we need it because the way the asset context here is retrieved is not in a safe manner for us. And to change that, we could go back here and say that the service scope actually should be a data loader scope. And then if we go back here and actually let's put that on the side here so we see what happens. So just by putting that here, now we get a nicely scoped service here. And no matter how many services I retrieve, it's now retrieved from this scope and all the complexity is handled by our source generator. But always specifying this, in this place is not so nice. So we already have source generators and they have this module attribute. And we introduced a second attribute here called data loader defaults attribute. And there we can specify that the service scope by default actually is the data loader scope. And then I can opt out of it rather than opting in. So now I can get rid here of this guy and still we keep the scope here. And the nice thing is we will analyze the method and essentially remove the get, remove the async, and then you have the perfect data loader name, which is asset by symbol data loader. I could, however, override that. If I wanted it to be foo, then I could override it and you can see the data loader did its work here and now we have foo. In our case, we want the correct naming so we let the data loader rewrite it again. And now we have asset by symbol data loader. So if we now go to our queries here, we just can comment that in. And you already saw here that we actually have here an interface. So I can use the interface or the class. Both is public at the moment. And then we could just inject it here. I'm going for the interface in this moment because then it's mockable and better testable. So I'm using asset by symbol here. And then this would work. And actually I want the implementation here to be internal. So I'm going here to my defaults and then I'm introducing here the access modifier and then we just say public interface. And by doing that, you can see the data loader does it work, rewrites our code. Now we have a public interface, but an internal implementation. But the beauty of it is that it also wrote all the registration code for our data loaders. So it's nicely registered here with my interface and we can just use it. So I have to do no more work here I actually can just run it. Let's do a dot net watch. It's coming up. Let's just go to our banana cake pump instance. Let's create a document and let's just use it. Asset by symbol. We want the name. And actually the symbol is Bitcoin. We run it and we get here our Bitcoin. So that worked perfectly. And all of this is done without reflection. It's generated code at build time. So you're not paying on executing your server. So let me show you one more thing because there are a couple of data loaders here. So this is what we call a batch data loader. So how would I write, for instance, a cache data loader? Let's duplicate that for a second and call that the S by symbol cache. So there are three data loader kinds that work out of the box. It's cache data loader, which is a one-to-one -one thing. The benefit from that is essentially that we cache the asset over the request. So if there's a second call to it, then you get the cached instance. So if a call is expensive, you could cache it and then other 
portions of your graph could use it. And then there is group data loaders, which is a one to many. So let's have a look at the cache data loader first. So in this instance, we would not have a dictionary here, but just an asset because it's a one to one thing. And then we wouldn't have multiple symbols, but just a single. And also the lookup would be more a first or default. And then actually this would be more in equals here. And then we would be actually okay. This data loader actually already exists. Let me pull that up. We can have a look here and you can see that we have now the cache data loader here and the, our old data loader down here. And we didn't have to do anything here. We just wrote this and actually our source generator understood that this data loader is a cache data loader and implemented the correct thing. But I could also think about it differently and say, maybe this is a group data loader. In this case, we would have here a lookup and actually this would be not to dictionary, but to lookup. So there is no async overload for this actually there. In my data loader here, I would first need to aggregate the data, then do a lookup of it. But anyway, the most important thing here is that our data loader actually understands what I'm doing here. So you can look the cache data loader here. Now it's a grouped data loader. And this is really awesome because I can just write the code that I need and the source generator will understand and generate the correct thing for it. So let's get rid of that and let me show you one more thing. So we have built in because there is no interface for this method. So if you're doing something wrong, like maybe you make this private, private, we cannot access it. It can be internal or public. If it's not internal or public, it will give you errors here in your compiler and tell you that actually the data loader has to be public or internal. Let me get rid of this. If we compile that, you would have the compile errors here and you could just jump to where the problem is. In this instance, it's here at the modifier. There are other things like maybe we have not the correct inputs here. At least you have to provide the keys. But if you didn't, then the data loader again would help you here. So in this case, this is the error that is blocking us. So we could make that a public. And then we would get another thing here. Actually, you have to insert parameters here. So this becomes a valid data loader. So you can see we are supporting you while you're typing with proper errors. One last aspect, and that is around data loader. So there is a pattern of using data loaders in the business layer. And in the business layer, we in general don't want to have GraphQL stuff, but we created the data loader package to be the green donut package, which has no GraphQL logic at all in there. You can use the source generator in your business layer to generate all the data loaders for you to use in your business services. And there will be no piece of hot chocolate. There's one setting to have that, and that is actually to tell us not to automatically write the registration code here. And what is happening then is that we are just generating, you can see the data loader, but there's no registration code because the registration code needs an I request executor builder. So the graphical configuration builder. So we remove that now, and now it's just green donor that you need in your business layer. And then you get all the benefits with this pattern. No matter what you're doing, it's very flexible to do data loaders now and very minimal code wise. Just as a comparison here, a data loader in version 12 took you 27 lines of code. And with Hot Chocolate 13, it's essentially six lines of code. So this line here is actually one just made it so you can see better. But this is six lines of code that you need to write now. And it's just the fetch logic and everything else is done for you. I hope this gets you as excited as me. I'm really keen on using the new data loader approach because it saves me so much implementation. What do you think about our new data loaders? Will you use it? Or are you sticking more to the inline approach in your resolver or to the class approach that we have today? Sound off in the comment. If you want to help our project, please go to GitHub and give us a GitHub star. And with this, I'm out.